All Affinity apps allow you to specify the dimensions of shapes and artboards when you create them. And in Affinity Publisher, you can also specify the size that picture frames are created. To access the dialog for this feature, I'll first select a shape tool like the rectangle tool, and then I'll hold Command on Mac or Control on Windows and left click on my workspace where I'd like to create the shape. Now I can input a value for the width and height and see how the shape looks. I could also click drag on the words width and height. We can link these to lock the object's proportions. The new object will be created in the position where you clicked, but you also have the option to change whether that relates to a specific corner, side or centre of the shape being created. I can click OK, tap Enter or Return or click anywhere on the workspace to create the object. This feature avoids the need to go to the transform panel after the shape has been created and it's particularly useful if the specific dimensions of a shape are important. For example, here I'm curating an exhibition space for an art gallery and I want to plan how the frames on the wall will be arranged. In this case, it's important that I work to scale, so first I'll assign a drawing scale using the measure tool. I know the wall is 5 metres across, so I'll click drag from one edge to the other. I'll hold shift to make sure the measurement is level. Then I'll go to the context toolbar and click assign drawing scale. I'll type 500 centimetres and press enter to commit the new drawing scale. Now when I go back to the Rectangle tool and Command click, I can type in the real measurements of the frames and they will be created to scale in the photograph. Usefully, each tool will remember the settings from the last time you created that shape, so I can create more frames with Command and left click. Remember, clicking the workspace will also commit the shape. Now what if we wanted the frames to be a specific distance away from the floor or from other frames? We can use the Move or Duplicate dialog. I'll just go back and undo these and then position the first frame in line with the bottom of the wall. To access the Move or Duplicate dialog, just select the object that you want to move and press Enter. Here you can input a horizontal or vertical value or you have the option to decide the distance from the original placement and the angle that it travels. You can also rotate the shape from here too. I'd like the frames to be 50 centimetres off the ground, so I'll input minus 50 centimetres and commit the change. I could also use the Move or Duplicate dialog to create other frames. I'll press Enter again to access the dialog, and this time I'll check the Duplicate option. Now I can input values to decide where the duplicate will be created. If the canvases needed to be 30 centimetres apart, I could input a formula to position the copy, so I'd like the copy to be 65 centimetres to the right, as this is the width of the first frame, and then I'd like it a further 30 centimetres from that, so I'll add the 30 centimetre gap. When I press enter, it will work out that the copy will be created 95 centimetres from the original object. Now I can simply create the number of duplicates to match the number of frames required. Here's a more creative example of how you might use these features. First I'll create an artboard. I'll select the artboard tool and command and left click where I'd like it to be created. In this dialog you can choose from a range of preset sizes or you could create from a selection but I'm going to make a custom size. I'll make it 1000 by 1000 pixels and create from the top left corner and then I'll tap enter to create the artboard. Now I'll command and click next to the first one to create a second. Like with the shape tools, it will remember the settings previously used, so I'll just click on the workspace to commit the second artboard, and then a third. I'll select them all and change them to black. I'll just press command and zero to fit the artboards to the workspace. Now I'll select the ellipse tool and change the fill to transparent and the stroke to white. I'll also go to the Stroke panel and increase the Stroke Width to 1. Next I'll enable Snapping and find the centre of the artboard. And then Command and click to create a shape. Like many other value fields, you can scroll up or down to increase or decrease the value by 1. You can also hold Shift to jump in tens, or Option on Mac or Alt on Windows to make finer changes to one decimal place. For this, I'll give it a width of 700 and a height of 400 and click OK. Before I duplicate this ellipse, 
I'll turn it into a symbol using the keyboard shortcut Command Shift and K on Mac or Control Shift and K on Windows. Now I'll access the Move or Duplicate dialog using Enter. I'll check the Duplicate option and change the rotation slightly. Now I can increase the number of duplicates to create my visual effect. These fields will also accept equations. So if I decide that I wanted 25 duplicates spread evenly, I can type into the rotation field 360 divided by 25 and press enter, and it will populate the field with the answer. When I'm happy, I'll accept the settings. Because I made my original ellipse a symbol, I can go into the symbol group and select the ellipse, and then explore resizing or transforming it to see what effects I can create. Now let's move on to the next artboard. This time I'll see what effect I can create with the rectangle tool. I'll select the rectangle tool and find the centre of the artboard. I'll command click to create a rectangle with a width of 500 and a height of 250. Then I'll open the move or duplicate dialog. To use the same settings that I used for the ellipse, I can check the previous settings option and enable duplicate. For the final artboard, I'll use the triangle tool. I'll create a triangle with a width of 400 and a height of 500. I'll use the previous settings option and again enable the duplicate option. If it needs some tweaking, I can use these settings as a starting point and add more duplicates to complete the pattern. Finally, I'll show you another practical example for using these two features. First, I'll select the pen tool and create a little marker. I'll hold shift to make sure it's perfectly vertical and then escape to end the curve. Again, I'll use the color panel to set the stroke color to white and then the stroke panel to set the stroke width to one. Now I'll switch to the move tool using V and go to the context toolbar and enable transform origin. Then I'll drag the origin to the center of the dial. I want the markers to begin at zero, so I'll press enter and open the move or duplicate dialog and rotate it towards the left by 20 degrees. Now I'll press enter to open the dialog again and enable duplicate. I'd like 10 markers between zero and 10, so I'll increase the duplicates to 10 and then change the rotation to reach the number 10. Minus two degrees seems to work best. Now I'll hold shift and increase the number of duplicates to 130. I'd like a slightly taller marker to identify every tenth small marker, so I'll repeat the first few steps again and create a slightly longer marker. I'll press V to access the move tool and again move the origin to the center of the dial. I'll press enter and move the tall marker by 20 degrees to the start of the gauge. Now I'll press enter again and enable duplicate. Set the rotation to every 20 degrees and increase the number of duplicates to 13. To finish off this design, I might click drag to select the markers above 100 and change their stroke color to red. So that was a few different ways to use the object creation dialog and the move or duplicate dialog. Thanks for watching.